Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Yeah, welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. How many Navy SEALs are there in the world, Anthony? Uh, at any given time active, there's probably about 6,000, I would guess. I have no fucking clue. I just made that number up. I feel like we've had 5,999 <laughs> on the show. This will be our 6,000th today. Welcome to the show. Jason Kuhn, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Thanks for having me, fellas. So are you mailing packages right now? I, I'm looking at your background. Are you? It's very Unabomber-ish out there. Where are you at right now? I'm in the basement of my house. This is where I work out of. This is where I train people on the yips right here. No shit. Wow. Uh, well, look, before we get into training people on the yips, uh, let's start with your personal background because uh, it's fascinating. You played baseball before going into the military, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I did. Played at uh, Middle Tennessee State, and I also played for two years at Tennessee Tech prior to that. Nice. Middle Tennessee State parties, I heard. They got a good baseball yeah, team, it's a, too. <laughs> it's a good place to go. It does party, yeah. I bet it does. My God, man. I bet you've got some stories. I'm looking at your college photos now. Good-looking kid like yourself back in the day in Middle Tennessee. I bet you were just doing all the things, weren't you? Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, mostly I was playing ball, but yeah, we had a little fun on the side too. We had a really good group of dudes while I was there and uh, we got ranked in the top 25. I think we finished around 19th as a mid-major playing in the Sun Belt Conference at the time. That was a pretty big deal for us and, <laughs> uh, you know, keep in touch with those guys constantly and just, just had a great go of it. We won the conference that year and uh, had a blast. God damn it, too. That sounds amazing. You always wonder what it's like being a college athlete like that. And uh, and then, boom, you get to actually do it. Uh, what happened after college? Did you get drafted in the majors? No, I did not. That was the plan. And I was progressing well enough to do so. No, I wasn't going to be a high round pick or had a whole bunch of people looking at me or anything like that. But I was certainly pitching well enough. I was a pitcher and a closer. Uh, came in in high leverage situations with runners on base to throw strikes, get us out of jams, and did that well most of the time and was well on my way to playing professionally until I threw six wild pitches in a single inning. In 2001, that was the most anyone ever had in the NCAA, and it still is. <laughs> I would say congratulations, but that's a, that's a dubious uh, honor, I think. It's the old well, Ankeel is what they call you know? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yes, you are technically in the record book, but I guess Rick Ankeel is as well. Um, as this is going on, did you know that you had something wrong with you? Yeah, there's one particular day where I believe that I did, but I never heard of the term yips or some of the things that I think are, it's, it's incorrectly called performance anxiety, uh, but I'd never heard of any of those terms prior to. I just thought I had gone crazy, and it's incredibly frustrating because I didn't feel nervous and I didn't understand what was going on with myself, much less how to explain it to anyone else when they're telling you to calm down and relax. And, you know, I am, you know, and, uh, but I, I went out in an inner squad. Uh, I went out, I played in the Northwoods league, which I think was ranked just behind the Cape Cod league that year in college summer ball, mm -hmm. kind of prepping you for the pros did really well, came back into my senior year and was just, just do it, throwing the ball as well as I ever had. Back then, you know, throwing 90 was a big deal. I was I was anywhere from about 88 to 91. Threw from the side, turned the ball over, couldn't miss. And I went out one day and I walked the bases loaded in an, in an inter-squad game just before the spring season. And I walked in two runs, didn't throw a single strike. I didn't miss the catcher, but I could not find the strike zone. Not a single strike in that entire outing. And I remember going out like in the left field just to be by myself because the pitcher is normally going to right field. And I, I just went out there to be by myself because I was like something that was weird. And I don't know what the hell it was. Man, that's <laughs> wild. I mean, the, the only thing that I can think of uh, as a kid was uh, John Schmoltz. Um, obviously, our co-host, uh, D'Anthony here, and, uh, and Hot Bob hosts a Brave show. Was, was Schmoltz the first one that you could remember who had the yips during a game like that? Um, well, his was more... I don't know that he had yips in the game so much. Like, he had some problems in the 1990 season. Uh-huh. Because um, in the papers in Atlanta, because I, I grew up in Atlanta, by the way, so the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, said that he had had some psychological problems 
you know, once he was on the mound. Um, and they were speculating that it was the yips. Uh, Bob, what do you got on that? I'll say the most famous one, I think there might have been a 30 for 30 or maybe one of those mini 30 for 30. Uh, that and Mackie <laughs> Sasser, the Mets catcher, yeah. who couldn't throw the ball back to the pitcher. <clears throat> yeah, they oh, kind yeah. of they <laughs> kind of parried it in Major League Two. Yeah. With Rube Baker. Remember wow. That guy? He's, he was like quoting uh, Victoria's Secret ads to himself. Yeah. So it, but it's – it was interesting the way that Major League did that because that is exactly the right way to handle it. And I mean, it's reductive in a way, but he he will explain to you because we'll, uh, we're Brace fans here. Uh, Tyler Matzik is one of your fucking clients. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, thanks, by the way, for the World Series win there. Uh, for real. That. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's like you, I think we've all done this in something before where you're thinking too much about what you're doing. Yes. Instead of like, you know, the reason that we're really good at fucking going clearing rooms and fucking shit up is because we do it a thousand times and we're not thinking about, we're just reacting to shit when we go. By, if you're still thinking about what you're doing, uh, like micromanaging your own physical movements by the time you get into the room, you're probably going to get shot in the fucking face. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's too late for that shit. The training is where that all that happens. But if you carry that like very deliberate mechanics into the game, now you're probably going to be fucked, right? Because right? you're like making on the spot corrections, and that's not like there's no Kentucky windage in baseball. You don't you don't like oh I'm I'm getting jammed a little bit, so I'm just going to swing a different way. Like no, it's you got to get in the cage and work on that shit. Yeah, and and for you, what did you do to work on it? Uh, I'm sure you went home that night and trying to figure out what happened to you. What did you do initially? Well, I'll tell you what I did initially. Yeah, that, none of it worked, but this is what I this is what I did. And you guys were right on the right track with where you're going and. I can explain what it is and how it works through some examples of shooting and stuff like that. But what I did first was, um, you know, when, once the train wrecked, it was, you know, you kind of, you start to worry about it. So, so most guys don't feel nervous when they first experience the yips, the nerves are a byproduct of having experienced it. You don't understand why it happened or if it's going to happen again or have a solution for it, if it does. So the anxiety starts to build and then that's where it goes. So I went from that outing in the inner squad and I was, playing catch the next day on the line and was fine. And then about in my fifth throw, I sailed one about 15 feet over my throwing partner's head. It's like, what was that? And then again, four or five right on and then way over his head. I mean, nowhere even close. People will stop and look like, what are you doing? I'm like, I, I don't know. It, it feels like it's coming out of my hand properly, but it's going way over there or way the other way. So Initially, well, you know, is it something mechanical and you start taking a look at that or, hey, it's mental toughness, you know, you got to just, uh, you know, be tougher about what's going on. And but I knew that wasn't the case because I was already proven I had already pitched in high leverage situations. So uh, eventually, you know, I just did everything I could. It snowballed to where it got out of control. I mean, I couldn't play catch in any capacity. So I uh, I did what I was against. and I talked to a psychologist and. Got some basic techniques of relaxation and visualization, which are the traditional methods of going about this, even though it really never works or I've never seen it work. And it helped a little bit, but it wouldn't override the yips or what I call a defense mechanism when I would get in a more dynamic environment, like a real game. And so then I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going back to my way. I'm a fighter. I'm going to fight. I decided I was going to throw until I could again. So it was a weekend when I was not traveling with the team, which hadn't happened since I was a freshman. Now I'm a senior. I'm supposed to be getting drafted. I'm not traveling. And I got a bucket of balls and a good buddy. And we went out to the field and I just started throwing. And at the end of that six hours, I could barely move my arm anymore. And I was more yippy or inaccurate at the end than I was at the beginning. And that's, that's when I felt just defeated. So that's what I did initially. And none of it worked. Trying to throw through it. And so I literally could not throw anymore. Didn't work, and the you know the tips from the sports psychologist also didn't work. Now, what do your teammates say to you as this is happening? Because I've been on teams, and I, you know we all have, uh, where there's a weak link, so to speak, and it's like, hey man, get your shit together. What the fuck is wrong with oh. you? Everything else. I, I'm sure you heard all of that. And then what's your response to it? Well, you feel horrible. I mean, you feel like you're letting everybody down, and I think that. Most of my buddies on that team, because we were real tight and had a lot of players back from the pre previous year where we had a championship team, were supportive in nature. But also, you know you're losing their respect. Or if, if they're not, you, re you feel like you are. Whether or not, um, you know, they look down on you because you are failing them 
you know, I, I, I don't know, but either way, you feel bad because you know you're letting them down. And I knew that I was. We didn't have uh, the depth and pitching staff that we had the year before, and I was going to be a key part of that, and I, and I felt horrible about it. But, you know, you got, you got, you, you, your bros are your bros. Yeah. And, and there's one particular time when I was, when I threw those six pitches in an inning, wild pitches, it was really like 20. The, we were playing Eastern Tennessee State and they stopped moving runners out of pity. And when the runners weren't moving, they weren't recorded as official wild pitches. So long story short, as I'm chunking them to the backstop, my buddy who comes out to visit me, our catcher, who's also my best friend and roommate. We saw each other in Baghdad years later. It was great. He joined the army. Um, but he comes out and he says, hey, man, you know, just relax and, you know, take a deep breath. And I was like, brother, let's just turn towards center field so nobody could see us. And we turned around and I was like, man, I'm not nervous anymore. I, I'm not embarrassed anymore. I don't care about all we're, we're well beyond that. You know, I was like, I just I looked at my arm. I was like, I cannot make my arm do what it's supposed to do. And he said, well, you just keep on throwing them, good buddy, then, and I'll keep on going and getting them, right? So that's what we did, and eventually I was taken out. But most of my buddies were supportive, mm -hmm. but, yeah, you feel horrible letting your team down like that. Yeah, nobody wants to feel like that. So you you made the point, and this is one that it's it's kind of hard to explain to somebody that hasn't uh, that hasn't kind of dealt with this before because it seems obvious what's happening to people on the outside. But you made the point that the yips are typically precluded – uh, or, or rather the yips preclude the anxiety that people think is the actual cause of it. It's, it's typically you start, there's a mechanical breakdown some for some, whatever reason, and we'll have you explain that as well. And then the anxiety follows. And that's exactly. like when you're fucking, when people have seen you do something over and over again, and now you can't do it anymore. They just, it's hard to understand that it is a, it's really, it's not, it's not a mental thing at all. You know what nope. I mean? Mm -hmm. For the most part, but it does, over time create some severe mental stress, which is yes. uh, what we'll get into. So <clears throat> explain to us what the fucking yips is. Well, the way I define it, I, performance anxiety and all that is false. All right. It's uh, because let's say uh, the anxiety is just as you described. So to, I call it involuntary tension in the execution of an action. So in baseball, it's involuntary tension in the release of a throw. So from where my arm comes from here forward, I'm having tension that I do not want to have in my forearm, wrist, hand, fingers, to the point sometimes of a literal contraction. And then what happens is, as the hand seizes up, when you first feel the yip, sometimes it's just slight. So as you're coming through and you have a little bit of tension in your hand or fingers, that's where the ball starts missing its target, as I was missing the strike zone, but not the catcher. Then you're like, what in the hell's going on? And it compounds upon itself with the anxiety of the byproduct, and it gets worse. So as you sail the ball, you're like, well, what was that? I'm going to work through it. And you, then you try to push through it, but because your hand gets tight, you can't get the extension and the release, and you wrap around the side of it. And that's where you see the spikes, where it goes mm -hmm. as a right hounder down into the left or into your feet or whatever. I almost hit the on-deck batter once. <laughs> you, know, you name it, I've done it probably out there. Well, sometimes there. you got to hit the ball, right? I learned that from... <laughs> Tim Ro Tim exactly right. That. Yeah. But the best way to explain it is through an example. When you shoot a pistol, right? Mm. You tell, and this is where I had an epiphany and how to create the training program for it. But when you shoot a pistol and you and you train, you know, new shooters, or even when you're warming up as a pro, you dry fire. Mm. You just press the trigger and it goes click. And then you put a round in the gun and you tell yourself not to flinch, just to accept the recoil as you press the trigger of the gun. But why do we miss and throw rounds? Because we have just the slightest little bit of tension in our hands or our wrists as we go to our, our, our rational part of our mind says, don't flinch, keep the sights aligned as you press through the trigger and accept the recoil. <laughs> but the subconscious automated part of our being understands there's an explosion taking place and registers it with a threat. And it says to tense up in order to protect yourself. Yep. You have a little bit of contraction, throws the bullet off path, and it's the exact same thing, in my opinion, that's happening with the yips. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like uh, try not to think about something. Yep. And right. you like try not to think about, for example, uh, a big penis. Yeah, or strangulation porn. Or st well, a dude that's with a giant cock that's strangle baiting. Yeah. Try not to think about that right now. I want the audience to try. Actually, try to. 
close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Yeah, well, take a real deep breath. Real, real yeah. deep breath. Pretend that, that this guy doesn't have a spotter either. Usually I would say in through the mouth and out through the nose, but for this one, keep your mouth closed. Yeah, absolutely closed. No for obvious air reasons, going yeah. out whatsoever. Now think about a, a, a man with a huge penis <clears throat> yeah. strangle baiting and, not, and then not think about not, it. And don't think about that at all. And for then the not think the day, about yeah. it for the rest of the day. And it's going to be impossible to do. Well, you, I mean, it's, it's, it really is that simple, <clears throat> which is why... To be honest, I mean, aside from just having general bad habits, when I would train new dudes, I would rather have somebody that's never picked up a fucking rifle in their life because they, oh. have, they have no idea what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. You can spend like a week just having them point and dry fire, and by the time you get to the range, that person will shoot expert every single time. But you bring some dude that learned how to shoot from his fucking uncle Peepaw. who's missing a fucking pinky yeah. because of a fireworks accident now you're in trouble you know what i mean <laughs> and so is your hand so is your hand um so afterwards uh i'm assuming you don't play anymore and, and that's when you decided to enlist in the military yeah yep yeah yeah failed you know so some people would say hey you were successful in baseball you got to play b1 ball and, and and i do and i appreciated that got to win a championship while i was there with some great guys, but um, I failed short of my potential, meaning had I continued on the path without the yips, I would have definitely been able to play professionally and, and didn't. So 9-11, that was 2001, the spring was 2002, so 9-11 was still fresh, uh, you know, in, in, in memory, it just, just occurred, and there was a part of me that always felt bad if I had gone on and played ball, like, hey, man, I'm going to be playing ball here while, you know, people are going to fight and defend our country and stop these attacks from happening again. So I needed a, a path for redemption for my failure in baseball. Also, just grad I only went to college to play ball. It was the only reason I went. So to, you know, graduate and get a job at an office somewhere, it just felt like I was killing my soul. And this is this is all new, you know, for, for my generation. I listened to my grandfather talk about World War II and Korea and everything. But this was this was all brand new. The, the kids growing up today have, have grown up with it. So. I was like, we're writing history in real time and I can be a part of it. And I couldn't think of anything more worthy to commit my life to at the time and started researching special operations and found out there was a path to buds and never looked back. Wow, uh, that's amazing um, <clears throat> because, you know, part of me wonders if you get there and you do something as hard as buds and, and becoming a you know, Navy SEAL and all that stuff, if some of that psychological uh, mishaps that you, that you had from baseball kind of carried over into the military where you were like, all right, I don't know, would you call it the yips for shooting, I guess? Uh, I've, I've seen that happen, but the difference in shooting is that, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot less going on in shooting than there is in, in hitting a baseball or trying to throw it. Like you're creating uh, two, separate, uh, uh, two separate torques at the same time Mm -hmm. And that those have to align with your release point for everything to work the way it, it sounds a lot more. Like if you just see somebody throw a baseball, you're like, oh, fuck, he threw a baseball. Right. There's actually quite a bit of mechanical stuff going on there. Mm -hmm. For shooting, it's just like if you have a stable platform and you're, uh, you're I mean, the, the left, right and up, down tweaks, like you, you don't want to do that. But it, I think that's a lot easier to fix in shooting. That's probably why, I mean, Jason, tell us about this. It's probably why that big revelation happened because it's so obvious how to fix it in shooting. Whereas we don't think about throwing a baseball that way because it's something that we grew up doing as children. You know what I mean? Like that what throwing the no, exactly base throw, right. for pitchers, throwing a baseball is something that you have done since you were a child mm -hmm. and you just know how to do it. But then yeah. when you, when you unknow how to do it, how do you relearn how to do it again? That's not a thing, right? Like imagine some British kid that's ever played baseball before and you're trying to te like, he's maybe bold and, and, cricket but he's never thrown a baseball before yeah you have to teach that motherfucker to not just to throw but to pitch right it's it's a lot more complicated yeah so describe to us what it was like when you got there were you nervous about what was going to happen and, and whether or not this would carry over a little bit uh but not too much because i felt like it really only affected me in in, in baseball and what really helped me be effective at buds was the lessons that i learned through that failure so i mean i i, I was lost directionless embarrassed sad confused and really frustrated resentful and i was reaching for the bottle of whiskey because i just i couldn't sleep and was trying to just crush it and pass out and i just stopped one night and i prayed and just tried to connect to god and stop telling you know all my problems and just feel 
and I did. And um, I felt peace come across my soul. And I just said, you know, I said, Jesus, help me. And why? Well, why did this happen? And I felt these words, man. I was like, just, hey, you're something better's coming for you. And what I did there is in that moment, I realized that, you know, I stopped looking. I thought I'd failed, man. I, I grew up battling feelings of inadequacy, but I was tough. I was a fighter. I stood up the bully, stood my ground and worked hard for everything that I had. And uh, but I was often overlooked due to my demeanor and appearance sometimes. And um, I didn't like that. And baseball was my outlet for respect. And that's where I gained it. I put in the work and I was good at it. And so when I lost it in that manner, it was very difficult. And I realized that baseball completely defined me. But I, I thought when I failed, I had lost my purpose in life. And now I was just destined to drift through life in some lesser existence. And when I stopped viewing the circumstances as having taken my pur purpose and started viewing them as having purpose for me to be forged into a more capable person is when everything changed for me. And I learned that, you know, baseball. Baseball defined me too much in the sense that I was dependent on it for my sense of self-worth. And I think there's a difference between valuing our profession and the things that we do. Like there's a part of me that will always be a ball player and a team guy, but, and I value that greatly. But when I left for the teams, I loved the SEAL teams and loved the opportunity to do that job, but I never felt like I was dependent on it for my sense of self-worth. And that was different in baseball. And that was a lesson that I needed to learn. And that victimhood produces more victimhood. It's a worthless emotion. I, For the first time ever, I allowed self-loathing and, and helplessness to enter my life. And that's where I, I woke up in my hallway one day, face down, couldn't remember the last week because I drank it all away and peeled my face off the carpet. And I remember thinking this really distinctly like, hey, man, this thing happened to you. Is it going to define who and what you're going to be for the rest of your life? And I was like, you got to you, you got to figure this out. You got to, you know, you, you, you got to do something. And that's when I you know, started shifting gears towards the Navy and, and special operations. But those lessons that I learned there, um, you know, what I do doesn't define who I am. Who I am defines what I do were crucial to me being successful in training and then having a decent career uh, in the Navy as a team guy. And as far as it translating into action and shooting or anything, it never affected me. But I will say it did enter my mind one time. I never thought about it when we got a grenade in our hands. We got to throw it, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I hadn't been thinking about it at all. But I think just the, <clears throat> with it being life and death like that, you know, that it just kind of unlocked the wires. And it had been a while. I'd been away from it, got the, got the grenade out of my hand clean. And it was never a problem. But it did for one moment there kind of like I at least thought about it. How fast was the grenade going, you think? Did you get it up to 89, 91? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it but weighs three pounds, shit. so I doubt it. Ah! Uh, you remember the scene in Band of Brothers, a second episode, Buck Compton throws a grenade. It explodes next to a German soldier's head. Mm -hmm. He was a catcher for UCLA, playing with oh, Jackie nice. Robinson, actually. And in the book, it talks about how that German was a, roughly as far away from him as second base would be. So he essentially threw a runner out, just like reflex wise, and you know <laughs> took a German's fucking head off. What's that? A hundred and fucking ten feet? Or oh, something that's like that? great. That's a pretty good launch. Like when you do expert infantry badge in the in the army, I think it's like thirty five me meters is the well. It's it's a big ass circle though. So th look, the farthest target is thirty five meters. Okay. And a lot of dudes can't do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of heavy, but you don't really throw it either. You don't throw it like a baseball. You kind of pitch it. You're supposed to pitch it. I threw the fuck out of it. Well, the look, if you're the, not, fir the you're first not one I the first one I threw I fucking drug it too. I mean it was a it was a dummy, right? So it just has these little fucking primers in it. And you throw it and it pop makes a popping sound. But I threw it like almost right into the fucking ground because I was trying to throw it so hard. Yeah. And uh, there's a you know an NCO standing next to me. and He's like, "What the fuck are you doing?" Are you? He was like, "Are you retarded? I thought you played sports." Yeah. So like, are you a thrower, not a pitcher? Yeah, I was at the time. Yeah, for sure. With you, tell me that grenade ended up blowing up somebody. Was it something cool at least? What's that? No, that was just in training. But when we would go through urban combat, like Salk and whatever, some of my buddies would see if I could put them through windows or wherever else. So I would get a crow hop, and I would just same thing, just wing it and yeah. just let them go. And it was a lot of fun. So my feeling to throw with all of that was fine. It never mm. affected me in the teams whatsoever in any real kind of capacity. So well, think about so Ricky and Keel has his issue, right? In uh, what was mm. it, the two thousand AL or two th NLDS? Yeah, yeah. Bob, Bob remembers. <laughs> I was there. Yeah, you were there. Two thousand AL, uh, two thousand NLDS, St. Louis, game two, one. Two scoreless innings, and then the third inning, he gives up four runs, and it ruins his career. Yeah, and uh, well, he did come back, but as a as an a, outfielder. Well, that's later that's on. what I was going to say. So you can see, I think it was his second year as a full time outfielder. Uh, he's playing center field. I think it's right after Edmonds left. 
uh, uh, or, or something, maybe Evans was hurt. But a ball gets hit to the wall. He's in basically in center, right center, grabs the ball and throws a fucking P to third base. Yeah. It's maybe like, the, might be the greatest throw in it baseball might, it's, history. It's one of the best I've ever seen, to yeah. be honest. It's one of the best throws I've ever seen right on the money. So it wasn't that he couldn't do it. You know what I mean? And nobody knew this back then. Like, there's no, nobody knew uh, – people knew what the yips was, but they didn't they – knew, they knew what to call it, but they didn't know what it was, I guess. Right. And with you, how did you know that you wanted to go into <laughs> psychology after getting out of the military and – train baseball players to help them get over the same thing that you were going through yeah i didn't really i uh i got out of the military i started working as a contractor for a little while uh stopped that in 2014 and was really again kind of in one of those crossroads like what what <laughs> what the hell do i do now again you know and i had a friend ask if i wanted to come speak to the vanderbilt football team about mental toughness and run them through some drills I was like, yeah, man, I'll do that. And it went really well and had a blast with it. It ended in kind of like a mosh pit, you know, everybody freaking out and whatever else. I, I felt alive again for the first time in a while and realized that I had an ability to take some of the experiences that I had been and translate those into the environment, you know, other competitive environments. So I wanted to be, I wanted to do it in a way that honors our creed mm. and but also it's like, man, we've got all these experiences and I know I can help people. So I want to do it in a manner that is, you know, honors our background properly, but, but does help people. So high schools started calling and teams started winning. We had a local football team here, won 29 games in a row and went from six and five to max preps, number one in the nation, uh, baseball team, 46 game winning streak, max preps, number two, just by learning through these principles of mental toughness and really the, the value in a team first mindset as it all relates to performance. But I had not worked with anyone on the yips until I met Tyler. Mm. The yips training that I do with people is a different program than what I typically do in my performance training through Stonewall Solutions. And I met him through Michael McHenry, who was his catcher with the Rockies. And Michael and I went to the same college at different times. So Michael had called our coach because he wanted to uh, set up a bachelor party for Andrew McCutcheon and take him to a range and go shooting. So he called me and asked if I could do that. And, and uh, we did that, had a blast with those guys. And they all kind of came up through the minors together, about eight or nine guys. And um, as we developed our relationship, they started asking me, you know, hey, when I walk into Yankee Stadium and I start freaking out a little bit, what, how do I focus? And just questions like that, I started thinking through – situations I was in to help them and because I played ball at a high enough level I could speak the same language and make the translations very clearly just stuff I wish I had known as a ball player that I've learned through combat and training and um, put it together for him. but Michael McHenry knew Tyler uh, very well and as Michael learned more about my story with the yips he said do you think you can help him and I said yeah I, th I think I can because I had taught myself how to throw over time mm. So you're not a trained psychologist and you, you didn't go and get a degree in psychology or anything. Nah, experience is the best teacher, right? <laughs> um, that doesn't mean I, uh, there has been a little bit of pushback. Uh, it got to me, without getting too much in the details, it got back to me that um, a mental skills coach who had worked with Tyler in Major League Baseball had uh, mentioned uh, to certain entities that him and I should stop working together mm -hmm. because we were prolonging his agony and he needed to move on from baseball. And I'm not mad at him. I mean, you guys know how it is. At this point in life, man, when people, you know, when the critics come out, it just fuels me. It's like, I need them, you know, what I mean? yeah. to keep me going. So um, and I just, I just smile. It's like, okay, all right. You know, but it's like, how, how, how would you think that, I man, is there somebody who has been able to perform in life and death situations, had the yips and has defeated it, might have something of value to share with someone else who's struggling with it, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, but sometimes we, for, you know, we as human nature, we forget to look outside of ourselves for solutions sometimes, especially if it's a threat to what we do. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all those people were well intended. I think that guy really cared about Tyler, but um, I wasn't going to allow it to define what we're going to go do and, and train. So I, I've been through it. I taught myself how to throw and I felt very confident that I could teach someone else how to do the same thing that I did. Sure. Well, two things. One, uh, Vanderbilt football needs a lot of mental toughness. Sure. Because they just get fucking boat raced every week. I, they I say they're, they're coming back this no, year. No, they said that they, what he said was they're going to be one of the top 
programs in football. It's I, like, all right, man. I don't know that any amount of mental strength is going to help them at this point. Probably not. I mean, look, at least it's it's probably the best academic school in the SEC. By, not, yes, not, even, not even yeah, probably. Yeah, it's not even it close. It's far. not even close. Yeah. The second yeah. part is, so take, take us through that. Let's say um, – uh, I, I don't want to dig too much into Tyler's stuff, nutsack. Not that he would care. That dude doesn't give a fuck. Like, he's the most open about his experience of anybody, and that's probably part of it for him is to not let it linger like that, right? Yeah, but I, I and that <clears throat> will lead me to this. Did you have the conversation with Tyler separately and be like, hey, dude, these guys are trying to push you out. I think you can still pitch, and I think I can help you. Is, is that how that conversation went? Well, he knew he could still pitch, and he did all the work. You know, Tyler's success is his own. I just helped point him in the right direction by sharing the lessons I had learned along the way. Um, but, yeah, I always believed that he could make it. When we met each other, we talked on the phone for a while, and then he flew out to Tennessee to meet with me. And one of the things I mentioned was, I was like, hey, man, are you a phenom or a failure? And I forget how he answered it, but I was like, you're neither, man. You're just Tyler Matzik, and that's all you owe yourself or anyone else because that's all you have to give. And – you know, step number one with this is it's kind of like being an alcoholic is you got to admit you're an alcoholic to beat it and start taking ownership of what's happening and moving forward. But the problem with the yips is prior to there had never been a plan that was effective that anyone would trust because all the traditional methods were failing people right and left. And he had been through them all. You know, he had been through everything Major League Baseball, as far as I know, anyways, yeah. had had to offer to help heal him. Well, I can't think so, of I can't think of a single athlete for Blast Knobloch. Uh, there's been multiple NFL kickers who have just lost. Steve Sachs from the Dodgers mm-hmm. couldn't throw either. I've never seen any of these dudes come back before Matzik. He's the first one I've seen come back playing the same position and actually performing better than he ever did before. You know what yeah. I mean? So it's not even just like yeah, there there weren't any known solutions or programs for any of this shit to fix this, but nobody had even figured it out on accident yet, which happens sometimes, right? Right. Like every now, like the Achilles injury, Dominique Wilkins and Kevin Durant are the only two that have ever come back from it, right? Yeah. And we know a lot about that. We know a lot about doing that particular surgery. We don't know shit about this. And it's like, it was a complete vacuum. Like once a guy started exhibiting signs of the yips, you're like, that dude's fucking done. Yeah, yeah. There's literally no hope for him. So I understand the psychologist saying shit like that. What's the process like? So Matzik well, calls you or whatever the fuck. What's the yeah. first thing you do to start diagnosing what the actual problem is? Well, you got to define the problem, right? Mm. So you got to know what it is you're trying to defeat in order to defeat it. So it's understanding that it's involuntary tension. It's not performance anxiety and it's not mental weakness. And I told him it's not mental weakness. And I know this because I went to Buds and in my class, we had 135 men started and 20 of us were left after hell week. And to get through Buds and Hell Week, it takes a tremendous amount of mental toughness. So at least at that point in my life, I had proved that I was extremely mentally tough. And I still could not throw a baseball properly when I had one in my hand. I like how so you've I'm got just, one on you right yeah. now. Do you, have, do, you, do you have like a holster on your side and there's a baseball in it just in case somebody breaks in? Fuck yeah, dude. I'm a writer. I've got a pen on me right like, now. Randy Johnson, Randy Johnson keeps a bucket of baseballs next to his bed instead of a gun. He should. That's a, that's a real thing. He should, dude. That's great. Can you right yeah. Baseball, there's never two, you know, a baseball, a beer, and a gun are never too far away from me at some good. point, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we got two out of three here on set, so yeah. we're good. In that <laughs> um, yeah, so um, so I wanted to allow, allow him to know because there's a lot of shame and guilt that's associated with it. And when I explained, hey, man, like this could happen to anybody. And it's some of the most mentally tough people, in my opinion, that end up getting this because they're, they're self-aware. But it's like the fact that you're showing up and still in the fight right now is, mentally, is mental toughness on display. You know, and um, so now it's about providing, you know, how are we going to get solutions to it? And I looked at it in two ways. One is through some mindset training, but not in terms of relaxation and visualization. I said, hey, man, did you, you know, because you don't feel nervous, as I said, when you first go to throw. So I'm going to teach someone how to relax if they already feel relaxed throwing the ball. They just can't make their arm do what they're going to do. It's solutions to the wrong problem. So on one hand. We do mindset training. I go through 14 principles. I call it the fundamentals of winning. And that's what I've been teaching guys, but I customize it a bit to be specific towards uh, the yips. And it has a heavy emphasis in player identity. You know, we've got to really have a foundation internally in who we are outside of the game or our profession. And I've got some tools to help players figure that out. Well, that's and- that's something that we do too when we're fucking uh, not, not actively in the gunfight, but, you know, afterwards or before it's like what what am i doing it's 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 drawing on your purpose right like what am i doing this for 
and it it, yeah. it gives you focus without giving you tunnel vision. It's it, it's a it's a mental technique that soldiers have been using for a very very long time. So it makes sense that it would work in this as well. Yeah, I call it who, what, why, mm. and just to consolidate about an hour and a half long lesson, you got to know who you are, what you want, and why you want it, independent of external circumstances or the game itself, and that ego has got to be grounded right there. And so, for like Tyler, let's crazy. say I don't, I don't know what his personal life is like, but if he had a, a wife and young kids, you're you're having him focus more on that than the stresses of everyday baseball, maybe something like that, right? We'll focus on the core foundation of who he is and mm. what it is that he wants to accomplish mm. it and why he wants to accomplish that. What's driving him? Right. Yeah. So if the wife and kids are what's driving him forward in the baseball ways, playing for identifying those things and getting alignment in them. And the other part mm. is throwing. Right. So when I we talk, we, we, we trained with three gunners or competition shooters at some point, And I remember one of them saying. We dry fire about 75% more than we shoot with live rounds in the gun to train the subconscious that when we press the trigger, nothing happens. And mm -hmm. I was like, holy shit, that's it. That's how we do this. So I was like, I got to recreate the dry fire process in the baseball. So what I did is I picked the ball up and I just placed my finger on the seam right here. And I just felt that and nothing but that. I could feel the difference between the leather and the seam and the stitches and rub my finger on it so that everything is right here. And then I just went from here to here and you just start reverse engineering the throw. And I just let that ball roll out of my fingers and, and, it, and it hit. I was actually standing in a living room in front of a recliner, scared I was going to break my parents' lampshade. I'm like 32 years old. you know. <laughs> and I let the ball just run it hit. And I was like, that felt good. And I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And, I, and there's more to the dry fire process when I train with guys. But in its most basic form, we are just going back to getting the feeling back. It's kind of like when you go into hypothermia and you, your blood gets tamed in the vital organs, like when you're getting surf tortured and you can't feel anything mm. up here. You're getting that feeling back and placing all the focus and feeling the seam roll off the finger or your finger biting down into the seam to get the rotation you want. And every time it hits, good to get a dopamine hit and associate that clean quality release with a good positive feeling over and over and over and over and over again until you can. And then you add in more pieces of the throw and then you back up to where we start to invoke the tension incrementally. So I can I can get you know I can get going long here and keep going. So if you guys want to interject, no, keep going. no this not is at all. I, fascinating. Yeah, I, and, and <laughs> I'm actually, thinking I've got like 50 questions, but I want same. you to finish. Well, real quick, if you, if I don't know what your schedule is like, can you stay a while? Because we got some sponsors that I got to read real quick. Um, but can yeah. you stay? Because you're endlessly yeah, fascinating. Yeah. And Dan and I have a million questions for you, so great. Uh, just hang tight. Uh, first, we're, we're sponsored by GhostBed.com forward slash Drinking Bros. Uh, all the deals in the world you could possibly imagine. 30% off everything in the entire store. Pillows, sheets, mattresses, adjustable bases. You name it, fill the cart all the way to the top. You get 30% off with the promo code Drinking Bros at checkout. 40% off the bundle package, which is the adjustable base and the mattress combined together on top of each other for one night of magic. You'll never get the yips in in this goddamn bed last but not least they got 50 percent off the old 3d matrix mattress best in the biz keanu reeves will deliver it to your house so i'm told if he doesn't call ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros and let them know that he didn't show and you want you want him you want him back we'll give you rich bernstein's personal Phone number. You sure will. You can call him directly if Keanu Reeves doesn't show up. At the Where the fuck, fuck is Keanu? Where's Keanu, huh? Damn it. Uh, <laughs> at the bottom of the page, you're going to see a 60-month page to go program. No interest as long as you have decent credit there. Click that box, and all the deals that I just mentioned earlier are applicable with that. You can walk out of there with a brand-new bedroom set for about $25 a month. Go to ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros today. Next up, we get dietsmoke.com. Let's go, fam. The perfect medium high THC gummies. Can't really say anything more than that, right? Mm. They ship them through the mail. I don't know how it's legal, but I love it. Uh, and they've got this plastic case that they come in. It doesn't matter that it's 190 degrees here every day. They were <laughs> sitting on my porch for three days, nothing melted. Every single square was exactly the same. The gummies are beautiful. Watermelon and blue, and blue raz are my favorites. I heard they've got some new flavors coming out. Mm. And then we uh, are doing a joint product with them, pun intended there. 
Uh, we got some Etta Bros coming out later on in the year. I got to hit up Joey and ask him when that's going to be. But if you're looking for that perfect medium high, I can tell you these are the only edibles on earth you can get that with. I've gotten them everywhere, kids, Vegas, L.A., Denver, you name it. These are the only ones that don't get me too high to where uh, my face is in the carpet like, like he was talking about earlier. My God, man, that's happened in the past. Not fun. Don't do it to yourself. Go to Diet Smoke. Dot com. Use promo code Drinking Bros for twenty percent off. I do want to warn you though: if you're taking a piss test out there for your for your job, well, yeah, you're obviously going to piss hot because there is THC in these, brother. But they're the best in the biz. And if you get like three jars, you get a discount anyways. And then with Drinking Bros, you get twenty percent off. That's super cheap. And there's thirty in each jar. Uh, I only need one a night. I use it for sleep. Uh, and then maybe seeing uh, an occasional movie or a concert. Go to dietsmoke.com today. Get some THC gummies shipped to your house. Promo code Drinking Bros. We'll get you 20% off. Last but not least, we got hardafseltzer.com. If you're having some diet smoke, you might as well kick back with a couple seltzers as well. 8%. Uh, no carbs, no sugars, no gluten. If you give a shit about that, the OG flavors are here. Uh, until September 19th. Dan, we just got the email today about the new flavors being uh, shipped out into the world, and that starts in September. So get these while they're still there because some of these will be gone, uh, and then we'll take your feedback from the new ones and then go forward. But we got the strawberry shortcake, lemon lime, uh, the old peach, and the blue raspberry. Let's go, dude. And if you're in the state of Tennessee, sorry we don't ship to you because we're in 50 fucking stores there. Go to hardafseltzer.com, look at the store locator. We're in Frugal McDougal's down there. Uh, somewhere in South Tennessee, Memphis, Knoxville, Chattanooga, Nashville, Smyrna, Hendersonville, Murfreesboro, you name it, we are there. If you're in Kentucky, go uh, right across the border to Clarksville and grab a couple 12 packs. We're in two stores there in Clarksville, Tennessee. The rest of us dummies in the other 41 states, we ship directly to your house. It's a full case. Get the party started for the neighborhood by going to hardafseltzer.com. Uh, appreciate you, you sticking with us through that. Um, D'Anthony, when you go through something like this and you got the yips and everything else, uh, you ever have it in the bedroom? Uh, no. Okay. okay. I don't know what that would even look like. Well, you just can't fuck. You know, you just can't find the hole. You don't get that groove. You don't get that dopamine hit. Anybody hit you up for anything sexual? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> That was the longest pause in this show's history. <laughs> I had to think through no? the answer to that one. I think we'll stick to baseball and golf. You know, we're good there. <laughs> oh, do you have golfers too? Yeah, golfers. It's very common in golf. But what I like about golf is it's less taboo. They're more open to talking about it as a community and trying to find a solution. And baseball, it's got this taboo nature. And that's why most of my clients are kept confidential because it could actually hurt them in the draft or mm. their scholarship money and stuff. And I want to, over time, break down those barriers and get this system in place because it's working and put them on the DL or red shirt them just like you would with a physical injury, get them a process that works back into the game and let them go crush their career the way they, they need to. Yeah. Because I, I, now that you said it, I totally understand it. If, if you were a draft prospect coming up and you heard, hey, so-and-so might have had the yips or they're working with somebody or whatever. Do we really want to draft this person in case it comes back? Because there, yeah. there's also no guarantee of that, right? I'm sure you've worked with guys where it's come back again. Yeah, so, you know, since Tyler won the World Series, that was just this last fall. And after that, I started getting calls from people to work with them professionally on the yips specifically. And from there, we haven't missed yet. All right, we're at 100% success rate, pushing up to about 20 guys right now, anywhere from high school to the pro level. Now, of those guys, there's been about two or three that have had relapses in games shortly after they were able to get back into games. However, all of them were able to overcome the relapses by getting back into the tools we had discussed prior. So I think what happens is once you kill it, you know, you beat that thing down, what you – when you're in the moment, especially by the time they found me and come to me, they've, they've tried a lot of other things and they're getting in, in a pretty bad spot. And so the walls are starting to close and the opportunities are starting to leave them. And then they start to throw well again and it feels really good. And you get some of that joy back and the opportunities open back up. Oh, well, maybe I will get drafted, you know, and then 
that monster tries to get its tentacles back up and say, hey, protect yourself again. And then we just use the same tools we use to just beat it back down into submission until it's gone completely. And so far, that is what's been happening. Wow. Because um, golf in particular, I, it's – I'm one of those people who was pretty good at, at almost every sport growing up. I could pick up anything. Golf was, is that sport where it's just so fucking difficult for me. And it's such, I mean, it, look, it's a game of inches, literally, uh, in golf over and over and over again. Uh, just I'm, like sex, yeah. Yeah, just like sex, dude. And that I'm great at. One of the best in the biz. Some say too generous a lover, but, uh, you know, that's for another show. With golf, though, you're putting constantly. Uh, you're in tight spots and everything else. Like, if somebody's having a meltdown mid-match, are they able to text you or call you? How does that work? Yeah, it depends on, you know, what kind of agreement we have set up. But generally speaking, yes. However, if they are typically – what we want I, in an ideal situation to train is to have some time. We need some time to not be in a dynamic situation and build the strength back up. So I compare the yips to having pulled a muscle but in your brain – and if you pull that hamstring out, it, you know, what they're doing now is it's like the, the comparable would be like this is if you pulled your hamstring, you go get it iced and taped up by the trainer. Well, in the same way a player gets the yips, they go get basic visualization and relaxation techniques from the sports psych 101 book. And then they throw them right back into a game, right? Full mm -hmm. dynamic game speed mode. And it's like going out on that broken hamstring and trying to sprint 100 percent and change directions in a rundown. It's not going to happen. It's going to blow out. Right. So generally speaking, we want to have some time to train. Now, that hasn't always been the case. So when it's not the case, if the coaching staff is on board and they will allow us to do the things we need to do and give this player some freedom to fail, then that helps tremendously as well. If not, it, it just adds to the pressure cooker. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean that it's impossible if those conditions aren't ideally in place. Uh, but so for a guy to call me in the middle of a match would be uncommon because there's not a whole lot we can do to just reverse it right there because to me this is less of a psychological uh, problem as as it is a physiological reaction to the environment similar to an adrenaline hit right got it yeah the interesting thing about the way you describe beginning for, from a pitching standpoint uh describe overcoming this particular issue uh this is it's the exact technique that hitting coaches use when somebody's swing is fucked up. Like if your launch angle is too high or too low, you don't they they, they don't put you on like the, there have been all these weird contraptions over the years where uh, I think they've they've some of them for golf as well. It's like uh, it's two metal pipes basically that go in to the plane that you're supposed to swing on, and you just do that over and over. That shit doesn't work. What they do is exactly what you're saying is break the swing down. Uh, into segments and then start with the final segment, right? Like this to here, right? That that thing, and then the load, and then all the other stuff. It, this is it's exactly the same process of yep. how we've been for fucking forty years now, at least teaching people how to hit. And for some reason, nobody ever made that connection, except for maybe Tom House and you over the last like forty years. Like for real, it, it seems like as much attention is paid to the uh, kinetics and physiology of baseball over the last 10 years, especially it's shocking that it took somebody who just kind of figured it out on their own in a team room to, to bring. Yeah, I know. Right. I, I think about that a lot too, but sometimes complex problems have simple solutions. Mm. You know, think about shooting. Like it was like foregrip forever. And now everybody the seat clamp grip and getting their hand way out on the gun. Yep. And for years and years and years, we, we shot differently. And somebody shows me that on the range. I'm like, dude, that's wacky. I put it up there and start I'm like, holy crap, my sight picture is way steady yeah. and it's reducing recoil. And I never even thought to do that. Of all this time, I shot a gun, thousands of rounds out the gun. And I never thought to do that. And, you know, so kind of the same thing here. <laughs> and, um, you know, we just build into it from the dry fire. We move into something I call talking to the tension where we, in, we want to invoke the tension on purpose because I do believe it's a physiological effect more so than a psychological response. So it's like, I, I would love to have an adrenaline hit and just go flip a car for fun, but I can't, it just happens. My central nervous system through the senses reads the environment and sends signals and the same thing. And it causes tension because the body is perceiving danger and it's causing tension in order to protect itself, survival, right? right. So we have to override that and we override it through the dry fire process and it's attacking you from here to here. And it is a mechanical issue because your hands wrapping around the side or it's squirting out the side or your arm angle might drop or guys typically, you know, it squirts or you wrap or you shovel it or anything in between in the survival mode. But we just have to figure out a way to override that. And once you have, I call it finding the interruption point. Once you figure out, okay, it's from here to here 
And what it's doing to my arm is this, you know, whatever it may be, it can be different things for different guys. Once you have awareness of it, you can have more intention, uh, you know, more intention about making your body do what you want it to do, keeping that finger on the seam. So I just think about this pointer finger staying on that horseshoe and staying mm -hmm. on top of it as it comes through. But then we get into a more dynamic situation where my throwing partner is further out and I can't just track my arm nice and easy because the ball won't have the force. It'll drop or I've got to lob it and now I've got to whip it. And the hardest throw in baseball is not 180 feet or the throw from the wall in the outfield, because when you can come through with full force, a lot of times you can override it or the speed of the game. You don't have time to think about it. You just get it and go. And there are some Band-Aid fixes, but I like to go get at the foundational level. The, the hardest throw in baseball is 45 to you know 58 feet, mm. in my opinion, because you can't you can't sling it and you can't lob it. And think of pitchers downhill, right? He's like, wham, 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 and then he fields a ground ball back to him, and he's 48 feet away, and he's throwing on flat ground, half speed, and they throw the ball away to first because it's hard, right? Now that's not a yip throw; that's just an inaccurate sure. throw. There's several things that can cause an inaccurate throw. But when we get there and we start to feel the tension, we want to increment, we want to build the environmental conditions incrementally and then get quality releases off within them. And that's where I have a system called talking to the tension. I want to be a little careful with the details just to protect my IP sure, a little yeah. bit. I want to help people also. And there's not enough time to get into all of it anyways. But a way to just calm ourselves fat down. It's like, okay, they're like, hey, just calm down. Well, I can't, you know, it's like I'm not, I'm not nervous. But my body is releasing tense, you know, it's, it's causing my muscles to get tense and I don't want it to because it's involuntary. So what I got to do is just bring it back down. If you think of like, um, if you think of the engine in a car and you peg the speedometer, it's like eight, 9,000 RPMs and the engine's about to blow. We want to, you know, say a normal amount of fear when you're going to, because you have to have some fear or at least concern, I should say, hmm. satisfaction or dissatisfaction for the outcome in order to be have any kind of focus. And we got to rev that back down in some capacity. So I try to get it back down as much as I can and then have some tools to get a quality release. And you give yourself freedom to fail with the first few ones. Like you expect the throws to be bad almost, right. and you, but you're just working on getting that extension and that dexterity and work through it. And then you invoke the tension more and then you invoke the tension more and you just continue to work through it until the subconscious part of your being believes and trusts that freedom and dexterity are the solution rather than attention. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things in professional sports that I think are particularly that, that would that anybody, whether they, they have the yips or not, could use this type of information to make themselves even better than what they are. So one of them is throwing a baseball, right? Maybe throwing a football as well. I don't know about that so much, but kicking a football for sure. For sure. Because there's so much time yep. to sit there and think it like throwing a football is usually under duress, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, uh, but kicking, it, it's some, there's, there's some duress there, but it's like every, there's 65,000 people looking right at your ass, right? right? And you, you have like... And you're expected to make it. Yeah, yeah. Every, single every single time, time, regardless of what the fucking environmentals are and shit like that. So kicking is definitely one of them. Golf is, it might be this, the most obvious next, 1A, 1B with throwing, yeah. a, throwing a baseball. But I would say shooting a basketball as well. Like what's happened to Russell Westbrook? He's never been a great shooter, but he's definitely like the struggles he had have definitely transitioned from the uh, forget Markel Westbrook. Fultz. Uh, Markel Fultz. How about Ben Simmons? Yeah, yeah Ben Simmons, Simmons as well. Yeah. Like, well, that's all the thing. Philly guys. The the, the 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 anxiety produced by the early failure has now gotten completely in these people's heads. You know Where's I mean? the anxiety of just moving to Philadelphia? A lot yeah, of people just don't want that either. But we see the like we see the lower level results of that on the basketball court maybe more than anywhere other than the golf course, and that that is when a guy's wide open for three and he thinks somebody's coming to defend him he's going to jack up a quick shot and then they don't come to defend him because they think he's going to quick uh, jack up a quick shot and then he's like all right cool <sighs> take my time brick every right. single unless it's steph curry the dude misses that shot every single fucking time right right because he spends too much time thinking he's like all right i'm going to get a really good release point on this no that shit should have happened in practice just shoot the fucking ball man yeah. and that's what it is right it's about having uh, uh the kinesthetic uh physiology stuff Locked in. Repeatability is the most important thing with jump shot, right? It's the most important thing with pitching. Uh, I went to Brave Spring training in 94 uh, and had the, the pleasure of speaking to Greg, the mad pisser, Greg Maddox. Yeah, yeah. And he told me, he was showing me the pitching rubber. Uh, I think he probably thought I was like a make-a-wish kid or some shit like that. But he showed me the pitching rubber. He's like, when I want to throw inside, I step right here. When I want to throw outside, I step right here. And it's this far apart. 
mm-hmm. like uh, his landing foot. Yeah. In front, like how, I'm like, how do you even know you're doing that? He goes, I don't. Yeah. It's like, just All right, cool, man. That's repetition. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how you win 300 fucking 60 games, right? I, I think, and I'm being totally sincere when I say this, I think that's how you're successful at anything. It's mm. just repetition, repetition at it yeah. every single day. I mean, there's days where, you know, you and I will be off for a week for Christmas or whatever. Yeah. And you come back and the first few shows suck and you're just like, eh, you're trying to get back in the groove of it every day. Yeah. I still feel like that on Monday mornings where I'm like, God damn it, man. It's about a half hour to get the engines going and everything else. Well, how, that's, that's one of the, th- the questions I wanted to ask you. So I know you said you want to stick with baseball and golf, but what lessons have you learned do you think are usable for stuff like what he's talking about or, you know, uh, write, writer's block is a big problem for people who write. Yeah. And it's, you know, yeah. they, you get all the same fucking, like, oh, it's just stay in the room and do this. But those aren't really, I mean, that, I feel like that's just piling on. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, so there's several, and that's where I get back to the fundamentals of winning curriculum, mm-hmm. the traditional performance training that I do. And YIPS clients that I work with, they do go through these things, but the YIPS is, you know, it's more of that, that involuntary interruption that we've got to override in a different manner. But on, on the more, you know, traditional side of things like that, like talking about with free throws and field goal kicking, is I came up with something called a high pressure checklist. And I remember talking to, um, I believe it was Garrett Jones with the New York Yankees at mm-hmm. one point. He's playing behind A-Rod and Tech Shera. There's a New York Times article on it that'll have more detail than I can remember properly here, but um, it's called A Military Mindset Keeps a Yankee Prepared. And he was like, hey, man, I got to get a hit every time, you know, playing behind these guys or I'm never going to see the lineup career end. I said, well, I said, here's the deal, man. You can't, you know, I mean, I guess theoretically you could, but nobody's bad at a thousand in the big leagues and nobody's ever going to. So you've got to free yourself from the requirement of the outcome. And what I mean by that is we don't become apathetic or stop caring, but what I mean is like your job's not to get a hit every time, man. Cause that's, that's impossible. Your job's to be the best hitter. You can be mm. one pitch at a time and place it there. I was like, the second step is be thankful. Like I blew my career and I'll never get to play ball because of my own fault, nobody else's, but you did it, man. You did all the right things. And here you are in the big leagues. And at the very least, you're going to walk into Yankee stadium and take batting practice today. So think of me when you're out there, because if you can't feel grateful and understanding gratefulness and feeling it are two different things. And so think of someone who'd like to be where you're at. And so, you know, we try to put that in there. So it's like, hey, I don't have to get a hit. I got to be the best hitter I can be. That's my job. Thankful to be here. If the crowd is terrifying you, take a look at it. Appreciate it. Be thankful for them. Even your worst critics would trade, you know, worst heckler in the stands would trade spots with you in a minute. And then spark confidence through self-talk, man. Just like when you patrol, you know, you walk through the streets, you walk strong when you patrol mm-hmm. and it, with intention. Walk with intention up to the plate, and when you get there, say something in your mind that he initiates an aggressive mental mindset and then execute. No matter what happens, let go of that one. Walk into this one, just like a sniper, as if it's the only shot in the world that matters, and win the fight in front of you over and over and over again. And that's been working. A a basketball team, a college one, told me that it increased their free third percentage, and uh, baseball players use it. I use it before I give presentations if I start getting nervous. Um, but the biggest thing, I think the foundation is in mental toughness and learning how to respond to adversity and how to shift our focus off the adversity and into the execution of action and our teammates and understanding that shift of focus into teammates and the value that it has, because it's normally taught as a moral thing, like serve the team because it's the right thing to do. But we always have that underlying question, what do I have to give up or what's in it for me? But when we understand how service to the team We'll actually we'll reach a higher level of performance by focusing more on our teammates than ourselves, because a majority of our anxiety comes from what's going to happen to us. Am I going to live or die in this gunfight? Am I going to succeed or fail? And when I'm playing fully in service to the team, that anxiety is like a parasite. When I defer my concern to the well-being of teammate and mission, then that anxiety has got nothing to feed upon. And then when we act like that, in turn, everybody's acting in a selfless manner. Um, then you build trust and love within each other. And it's the most powerful thing on earth because I'll tell people, Hey, you can come fight me. And if you win the fight, you can tell everybody you're more badass than a Navy seal. You took me down. Right. And most of the time people don't want to do that. But if I say, think of the person you love the most in the world, put them in your mind. Imagine I have that person behind me and you have to come through me to get to them or you never see them again. Would you fight me now? Everybody would, Every, even a corporate presentation full of all sorts of different folks. Everybody's hand goes up, right? And not only would they fight, they would probably find a way to win because they're fighting for something greater than themselves. And that feeling they had with each other didn't pop out of thin air. It was created by meeting a standard, an expectation and a standard over the course of time. So breaking these things down, like mental toughness, team first mind, and showing the individual how it's going to enhance 
not only team performance, but their individual performance is crucial. And if you'll go back and read some of the interviews with Tyler when he came in behind. Um, to share. Uh, and no, uh, no, Tyler Matzik oh, came Tyler. In, behind him in the playoffs. Johnson, was it Johnson? Um, somebody had a rough go of it and Tyler came in behind him and that's when he Luke Jackson. Out Luke Jackson, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, how were you? You know? Yeah. I was going to ask you, how were you feeling during that? That was arguably the biggest moment in the Braves, Braves entire playoff run. Yeah, well, I don't I don't cry, but if I did, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> I had tears, man. It was um, tears watching it in my living room um, and just couldn't have been more happy for him because he's the best dude of all time right he's so great so besides so all great. the struggle and overcoming the struggle having it happen to a guy like that is a big deal exactly right man it could not have happened to a more deserving person and i mean i busted tyler up with some workouts i mean i pushed him very hard and he has all heart and soul and he was putting in the work when nobody thought it could happen and when no one was watching and then for him to be rewarded in the way he was was just god smiling down on us and blessing us with more than we deserved it was beautiful it was awesome and it provided fulfillment to everything that i had been through you know becoming a seal after the failure in baseball was redemption enough but to see all of this unfold you know i looked at my wife at the world series with tears in my eyes and i said you know having lived the life that i've lived and that's the key there's always the choices we have along the way but I would rather be here watching him pitch in the game than pitch in the game myself because it was fulfilling. And I believe that, you know, life has pain and we can't stop that from happening. But if we suffer well, we grow in character and capability and then we can achieve more. And the lessons learned along the way, then we can turn around and help other people. And that provides fulfillment to the pain. It assigns meaning to it, yeah. you know, and that's how I try to view things. Yeah, it's not about you. That's what service is all about. That's that's may maybe even more than the the revelation on the gun range that you figured out about dry firing, it was, it may have been just shifting your, your mindset to service that laid the foundation for all that to happen in the first place. I will say, you know, I had a, I, I, I want to get into deep, you know, I got to be careful with the relationship. People know who I'm talking about, but I had a frictional relationship with my college coach and, um, and I, and I didn't like it. I, I looked up to him and, and, and wanted mm. affirmation and for him to value me. And, uh, there was a lot of misunderstandings and miscommunications and even hands on at one point and, um, you know, whatever. And I, um, at one point when, um, something happened that I just felt was completely not right. I was like enough of this, you know, when, when, um, when some, some, when money got screwy that had been promised, I, I was like, okay, enough. I'm, I've done what they all say today. I've done listening to these guys. You know, you've taken the bat out of my hand, made me a pitcher only, this, that, and the other thing. I'm playing for myself. And I did that for a while, and it worked. You know, um, I was going to play the game how I want to, and I'm playing for myself. And I'm, not, I'm done listening to what anybody has to tell me. And it was right to break away from the dependency that I had and the need of affirmation from certain peers. However, I needed to channel it completely into service to the team, completely selfless, rather than, um, you know, I'm just going to, prove everyone wrong for myself. And I, I mean, I was still a good kid. I wasn't like, I wasn't a jerk. I was a, I didn't run my mouth on the field. I didn't show a lot of emotion on the field or anything like that. I was a good teammate and loved my teammate. I think they, my buddies would say I was a great teammate, but yeah, that internal foundation of, yeah, really like, Hey man, I'm just going to play for love of the game and love of these guys and nothing else. Yeah. I guess part of it is, uh, in addition to diagnosing what the issue is, is also diagnosing what it is specifically that motivates this person that I'm trying to fix, right? So for yes. pe for people like Jordan, it's proving people wrong. Mm -hmm. That's what he can that and not losing. I don't even know if he likes winning. He just hates to lose so much, right? And he he really enjoys. I mean, that's what he if you if you watch the last dance, that's what he did in every major moment of his basketball career was even if it wasn't real, he would make an enemy for himself yeah. and fight against that enemy in his mind. Even if it wasn't, nobody else may, would, would even know about it. He's like, fuck it, Cra Craig Elo. Yeah, and yeah. everyone's like, Craig Elo's dope. What are you talking about? Fuck that guy. Honky. Bam. Yeah. Nails a jump shot over him, jump, fist pump, blah, blah, blah. For Matzik, he's probably not that kind of guy, right? He's not, like, he's a very affable dude. He's not like Jordan. But there still was something that motivates him. You know what I mean? You find that thing and you leverage that, right? Yeah, and I'm surprised that he didn't ask you to be there during that that moment. You said you watched it from the couch. Um, well, I did. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, but I, I would imagine most of these guys would want you there in the biggest moments. 
Yeah, so um, I I did go down to the World Series, and I had been down to Atlanta to go and, and, and see him, and and that's not uh, <laughs> that's not on him so much as at me. I got three kiddos running mm-hmm. around on my own, and, uh, business to run, and everything else, so I get busy. Uh, but the NL or the uh, you know the National League Championship Series was when I believe he struck the three out in a row. What we were referring yeah. to, I did go down to the World Series and watch him live, and um, uh, just was incredibly. I'd never been to a World Series game. And, you know, the 90s Atlanta Braves, that was my team, man. Same, you know, same. all those guys growing up, that yep. was my team. So not only did it circle back around where I got to um, help someone solve the same problem that I had, it was also for my childhood favorite team. Yep. You know, it, was, it all came full circle. Uh, is is the eventual goal to have, like, maybe instructional videos like Tom Amansky or something like that, like a – uh, a mental version of it, of how to approach. Or be uh, the mental Tim Grover. Y- yeah, yeah, right? exactly. Tim Grover's yeah. fucking dope. Um, is that the eventual goal where you can maybe put put out videos like a master class, um, you know, how you see on Facebook and things like that, to teach people uh, mentally how to get through some of the toughest situations in their life? Yeah, it absolutely is. So I'm going to have one that's just general performance training, the fundamentals of winning like I like I have been doing. And I give those right now in the form of keynote speeches with corporate groups and sports teams. And then I do it one-on-one with individual athletes. But the YIP specific stuff, as I said, this has been very new because I just started getting clients after Tyler. So we're pushing about 20 right now. And I do want to, so I went from, with Tyler, a lot of the work was live. um, And then it was over the phone and the computer after that. And, you know, he was well on his way before he met me, too. It was funny because a lot of the theories of how he had already been taughting, teaching himself how to throw was in alignment with what I was about to share with him anyway. So he was already and, and that just, you know, helped reinforce that I thought this was right. But, yeah, absolutely. So I wasn't. I, so I'm doing them now over Zoom because I can't work with everybody one on one. It's just that there's no way to do it all that. So the the uh, I, I, I wanted to see if working over zoom sessions without being live with people would work and so so far it is a hundred percent but now we've got to see if okay well can I recreate that in a video format without me being there live and being able to interact with those players or at least interact on a minimal level um, so I gotta you know I got to evaluate how I think that's going to work because the number one thing here is is effectiveness you know and then everything else will, will branch off of that. But I, I don't want to miss one time. Uh, I, I'll, I helped a buddy out with it one time. Um, I wrote some stuff for him. So make sure it's written. Don't, don't, don't go off the fly and then just keep looking into the camera, even though it feels weird. Um, and you'll, you'll get it because you're a super motivational guy. And this, this episode was just fucking awesome, mm. dude. Uh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, now is the point in the show. We get to the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. Who would you like to give the drinking bro of the week to? Oh, man. Somebody who has inspired me to be the person that I am today. So, obviously, there are several people who come to mind from, uh, you know, my platoon chief to our OIC back then to my father. But I want to say, since we're talking about the yips today and a lot about Tyler Matzik's story, I want to talk about Michael McHenry, uh, who was Tyler's catcher in the, in the Rockies organization, because t- he put all the pieces together and he believed in all of us from me to be able to present to Tyler my story and believed in Tyler to overcome this and get back into baseball. So as far as this story goes, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to call Michael McHenry the drinking bro of the week. Awesome. Awesome. Cheers. Um, how can people find you uh, via the web or social media uh, to potentially book your services if one of our listeners is going through this at home? Because we don't have necessarily a lot of famous athletes that are listening, but uh, there's a lot of writers and, and things like that, people who uh, – uh, you know, train different individuals that we will leave unnamed, obviously. But uh, how does somebody find you to book you on a on a weekly basis or something like that? Yeah, I appreciate that. So I'm on all the major social media sites, although I don't engage it all that often. Um, you know, I got to figure all that out. And uh, I've also kind of reserved in nature and just been very careful with how I represent my background. I want to do it the proper way. Uh, but I'm getting more comfortable with that and uh, the blessings from 
uh, some of the community and how I'm going about it. So I'm going to get a little more over it there. But Stonewall Solutions is the name of my company. It's stonewall-solutions.com. My name is Jason Kuhn. That's K-U-H-N. And you can find Jason Kuhn 255 on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Truth Social, uh, you name it. You can find me out there. I'm out there somewhere. Um, I also have yipsfree.com, which is a website built separately from my original one specifically for the yips. There's not a whole lot on it yet, but there is some testimonials, a little bit of information, and I'm going to continue to build out content, including a link to this podcast on it so people can get on there at least and start getting pointed in the right direction. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, last question. Have you, have you thought about it this show or no? Say it again. Have you thought about it this show at all, like throughout the last hour, hour and 10 minutes? Thought about what? I'm confused. Yeah, you lost The him. guy with the huge penis strangle baiting, yes or no? <laughs> you know I was going to tie that back together. Come on, dude. Well, I can honestly say no, man, because I didn't even know what we were saying. Yeah, so you're a master then. You've, okay. You've, you've learned to defeat the problem that most people have. <laughs> Like master of focus compartmentalization right yeah I put, I put, yeah i just put that one that one went out like white noise right, right out there man. <laughs> i have to check because look if somebody is out there and they want to book your services we want to know that you're legit that's the way to vet you is if you didn't think about the guy yeah. with a huge penis strangle that was a that double talked about earlier that was a double blind test and he passed he did so so look you know, science. You know how you do it right you're right. So it's like, think about in a convoy, if you're a team leader and you say, hey, man, don't think about getting blown up, right? Then everybody thinks about getting blown up. You say, hey, man, think about the three things you're going to do as soon as we get out of the trucks here. And you put something proactive in their mind, like, hey, block out the crowd. You think of the crowd. Attack the inside part of the baseball. You put something in there, right? So mm -hmm. the more you dial in your focus, that's how you compartmentalize is by dialing your focus into the detail of what you're doing. It, it brings you down a layer, makes everything else drown out, right? A f so, so like affirmative I was things. just focused on the ships thing, man, and yeah. so I wasn't thinking about all that. <laughs> well, <laughs> look. Good. <laughs> Good. People yeah. at home are still thinking about the day. They dick, sure are. I guarantee you. One. I. What do you. What do you think? Uh, one thousand listeners at least were thinking about that dude's dick throughout yeah. this entire hour and ten minutes. I, I would say at least. Yeah, yeah, at least. At least you're not one of them, Jason. Proud of you. Uh, proud you. of you. Go to Stonewall-Solutions.com if you're interested in uh, Jason Coon's work. Uh, you won us a World Series, so uh, we appreciate it here as Braves fans, diehard Braves fans on this set. Uh, thank you for your time today. We'll let you get back to making bombs there, Kaczynski, okay? Yeah, thanks, fellas. Thanks for having me. I yeah, had man. a great time and appreciate it. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. For Jason Kuhn, Anthony, Anthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros Podcast.